Welcome to the Bald Brad Show. Our story here is regarding my home state of California wanting to pay out reparations to either all black people in the state of California or only those that are descendants of slaves. This one comes from KTLA and they title it Black Reparations Panel Divided on Who Should Get Compensation. Now, there is a little bit of a backstory here. In 2020, my great governor, Gavin Newsom, and of course, folks, I'm joking when I say great, he's absolute garbage. We have to be honest with one another. He created not one, but two task forces to study and plan the effects of slavery and the Jim Crow laws and how those injustices affect those that are living today and how they should be compensated for those injustices. Well, that brings us to kind of modern day here, where California's first in the nation task force on reparations is at a crossroads with members divided on which black Americans should be eligible for compensation as atonement for a slave system that officially ended with the Civil War, but reverberates to this day. I want you to hold on to this word atonement because I'm gonna come back to it here in a moment. Some members wanted to limit financial and other compensation to descendants of enslaved people, while others, get this, others say that all black people in the United States, regardless of lineage, suffer from systemic racism in housing, education, and employment. The task force could vote on eligibility on Tuesday after putting it off last month. Gavin Newsom signed legislation creating the two-year reparations task force in 2020, which I just mentioned, making California the only state to move ahead with a study and plan with a mission to study the institution of slavery and its harms and could educate the public about its findings. Now, what's interesting here is, again, they use that word atonement. And we hear this a lot in, in uh, Catholicism, Christianity, and it generally means, you know, one and done, that it's over, it's not going to happen again, you're good to go. Here's the problem, is that they're equating slavery with systemic racism, and that if you compensate them, whether that compensation comes through the form of housing or businesses or money, whatever it may be, the mere fact that you compensate them would atone those injustices, meaning it would get rid of the injustices of slavery or systemic racism. But the problem is it's the system within itself that they believe needs to be destroyed and torn down and rebuilt so that those injustices aren't being affected or affecting those that live today. Meaning that even if you compensate these people, the system is still there. The system is going to be there after you compensate them. Thus, they are going to continue to be held down. Thus, it doesn't solve anything. It's actually not going to be atoned whatsoever. The problem will still persist. The problem will continue. And then we'll still hear about this whole thing about systemic racism is holding people down, you know, yada, yada, yada. Well, the committees here uh, is not even a year into its two-year process, and there is no compensation plan of any kind on the table, but there's a broad agreement among advocates of the need for multifaceted remedies for related yet separate harms, such as slavery, Jim Crow laws, mass incarceration, and redevelopment that resulted in the displacement of black communities. Check out the compensation here that they're thinking of. Compensation could include free college, assistant buying homes, and launching businesses, and grants to churches and community organizations, advocates say. Yet the eligibility question has dodged the group since its inaugural meeting in June, when viewers called in pleading with the nine member group to devise targeted proposals and cash payments to make whole the descendants of people enslaved in the United States. But again, we're fooling ourselves if we think that this is gonna make somebody whole. Just because you compensate somebody with some sort of cash or some sort of incentive does not mean that they're gonna make good decisions with that cash or that incentive. And thus, they will still utilize the system out there for maybe their bad behavior and how they're gonna utilize that cash. Maybe they're not gonna get out of debt. Maybe they're not gonna pay off their house. Maybe they're gonna do certain things with that money that would not necessarily benefit them. And so who are they gonna still blame? The system, very good. The system they're still gonna blame. Kamila Moore, the committee's chair, and she expects to she expects robust uh, discussion on Tuesday's meeting, which will include testimony from genealogists. She favors eligibility based on lineage rather than race, saying it will have the best chance of surviving a legal challenge in the conservative U.S. Supreme Court. So she doesn't fully believe that it should just be based on lineage. She's only utilizing that because she's going, well, the odds are this is our best opportunity of getting this pushed through just so some people can get reparations. I'm sure she fully believes that every single person of color is being affected in some way, shape or form by some sort of system that was created out there in the ether by the white man that's, you know, in some way, shape or form, keeping them down. And she's hoping she's hoping that this will get pushed through.
A reparations plan based on race would attract hyper-aggressive challenges that could have very negative implications for other states looking to do this, uh, something similar, or even have the federal government, she said. Everyone's looking at what we are doing. And that's why I'm bringing this article to all of you, because you might be saying, well, I don't live in California, thank God. Yes, thank God you don't live in California, but other states are going to look at this. You might not necessarily be living in a totally uh, blue area. Maybe maybe your area is somewhat purple or it's shifting blue. And or at some point in the future, this could be looked back on by your state and some sort of locality could vote this in or your state could vote this in or the federal government might look at this and be like, hey, if California did it, why don't we just do a sweeping reparations all across the board here? So this is not a good thing <laughs> unless you are totally on board with reparations. California Secretary of State Shirley Weber, who authored the legislation creating the task force, had argued passionately in January for prioritizing descendants for generations of forced labor, broken family ties, and police terrorism. You could tell exactly where she leans here when she says police terrorism. Come on. The daughter of sharecroppers forced to flee Arkansas in the dead of night, she recalled how the legacy of slavery broke her family and stunted their ability to dream of anything beyond survival. Opening up compensation to black immigrants or even descendants of slaves from other countries will leave U.S. descendants with mere pennies, she said. But members at February's meeting, nearly all of whom can trace their families back to enslaved ancestors, question the need to rush on a pivotal question bound to shape reparation deliberations across the country. Task Force member Lisa Holder shared a poignant story of losing her child at delivery because the medical staff did not take seriously the concerns of a young black woman who knew something was wrong with her baby, she said. In the U.S., black mothers are far more likely to experience a pregnancy-related death than white people. That's an odd thing to say and then correlate it to some sort of uh, racism or some sort of system that's out to get you because the medical staff did not take seriously the concerns of a young black woman. I mean, that's, that's merely subjective. Mind you, I'm speculating here. I don't know the whole story on this woman. It's terrible that uh, she lost her child during delivery. I don't think anybody would think that's a good thing. But to equate the medical staff on not taking her condition seriously or whatever it may be, maybe they did take it serious and you were just lost a baby regardless. I mean, this is what people do. They equate some sort of injustice of something to do with racism and, and, and blank statement it all across the board when it could be just merely happen chance or you did something wrong or, uh, you know, it was just a sad circumstance like this person lost their child during delivery. But they're going to equate it to, to the system. The system's out to get there and, and the system's only benefiting white people, not black people, because there's a statistic out there like this woman's quoting that black mothers are far more likely to experience a pregnancy related death than white people. It's the system, folks. It's the system that's doing that. The system's a black reaper coming around and just taking babies and, and only babies of black people and not white people. No one asked me if my ancestors were enslaved in the United States or if they were enslaved in Jamaica or if they were enslaved in Barbados, said Holder, a civil rights attorney. We have to embrace this concept that black lives matter, not just a silver of those black lives, but uh, because black lives are in danger, especially today, but doesn't specify how in danger the statistics on it, why that person uh, was incorporated within that st st uh, statistic on an individual level. None of this can be talked about because even if you bring that up, even if you bring that up and treat that as a blanket statement, you're a racist. Critics say that California has no objection or no obligation, excuse me, to pay up given that the state did not practice slavery and did not enforce Jim Crow laws that segregated black people from white people in the southern states. Now, I would go with the step further and say the people living in the state didn't commit those injustices, thus are not required to pay out any sort of monetary settlement because they're not the ones that created those injustices in the first place. I didn't create Jim Crow laws. I wasn't racist against, against people. I didn't own slaves. My family members didn't own slaves as far as I'm aware of. Maybe I'm wrong. Who the heck knows? But why should I have to pay money out of my tax dollars for somebody else when I didn't do anything in the first place? But that's not going to stop them from pushing this because, again, it's coming out of somebody else's pocket, not theirs. But the testimony provided to the committee shows California and local governments were complicit in stripping black people of their wages and property, preventing them from building wealth to pass down to their children. Their homes were raised for redevelopment and they were forced to live in a predominantly minority neighborhoods and couldn't get bank loans that would allow them to purchase property. I don't think anybody would disagree that those are bad things and maybe some way, shape or form could be paid out. My question is if we're gonna have this conversation of how we're paying people out for those types of injustices, what's the formula for that? Because we're saying that they, they were prevented by building wealth and passing it down to their children. But what's to stop the government, meaning the state government of California, giving you some sort of money in some way, shape, or form, you making bad decisions with that money, and it's still not creating wealth down the chain. 
meaning you're not passing down that wealth to their children because you continue to make bad decisions. And this goes on to something that I think a lot of people might have a problem with. How many years or generations does it take for a family that is descendants of slaves or descendants of Jim Crow or whatever it may be? My question is how many generations does it take to build wealth to get yourself out of that hole? The answer is it only takes one generation. Many millionaire books talk about this. Nobody stopping anybody, regardless of race, is stopping nobody from going down to an institution like Charles Schwab, Vanguard, these financial institutions, speaking to an advisor and asking them, how can we create wealth? How can I take advantage starting at 18 years old to capitalize on compound interest? But you know what people say? They'll come up with all sorts of excuses and go, whoa, 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 hold on a second. Well, they don't know about that. They don't have anybody in their life that's going to sit there and educate them. They have nobody in their life to point them in that kind of direction. You're telling me there's no public library. You're telling me there's no teacher in their entire life that has pointed them or talked to them about compound interest or some sort of financial gain here. You're telling me there's no cell phone out there that they can utilize to hop on YouTube to see how they become rich. You're telling me there's, there's none of this stuff. There's no Barnes and Nobles. There's nothing you can just walk into and read a book and try to figure this stuff out. It's all excuses, folks. It's all excuses. It is a lot easier. It is a lot easier to blame a system out there than it is to work hard, grind, work multiple jobs and make good decisions for decades in order to become wealthy. And people don't want to do that. Again, it's a lot easier to blame others than it is to blame yourself. And that's exactly what's happening here. I know people don't want to hear that. and I know it's tough to hear that, but there's a lot of people that are not descendants of slaves that came over here in, in hardship that capitalized on what America has to offer. And they made good decisions over the course of multiple generations. They made good decisions. Even when they were put down, they made good decisions. There's a lot of Asian Americans out there that were pushed down and held down. The Jewish community was pushed down and held down and look where they're all at now. They didn't stop. They didn't look for reparations. They pushed forward. And now a lot of them are wealthy and making good decisions. There's a lot of them that aren't as well for making bad decisions, but I think you understand my case in point here. Today, black residents are 5% of the state's population, but overrepresented in jails, prison, and, and homeless populations. And black homeowners continue to face discrimination in the form of home appraisals that are significantly lower than if the house were in a white neighborhood or the homeowners are white, according to testimony. According to testimony. Again, they're looking at some sort of statistic that could have been predicated on some sort of, out, um, some sort of uh, effect that caused that statistic to be the way it was that drove that appraisal down. And I'll give you a prime example here. Say you're in a neighborhood and the neighborhood is underprivileged, okay? Say that neighborhood is high in crime. Well, of course your appraisal is going to go down because it's high in crime. People don't wanna move into that area. The value of that area isn't as high. And just say that area is, it just so happens to be a person of color area. Well, you're gonna attribute that then to maybe a, a white homeowner that's in a different area or a different neighborhood that doesn't have that type of crime is, is more policed, thus their appraisals are gonna go up. So they take those two disparities and they equate them with one another. Now you'd maybe have a case here if you're both living in the same neighborhood on the same street and your house appraised in a different way, like a drastic difference in appraisal, not like a little one or 2% here and you're gonna use that disparity to create some sort of uh, argument there for racism. I'm talking a massive disparity here. You're on the same street, a white person, a black person, then yeah, you have a case. But I don't know if that's happening here. There's not enough information because they throw blanket statements out there. They keep everything general because if they keep everything general, then it's for their argument of racism. And even then it breaks down. Well, it says here, this a director of reparation education project is among longtime advocates who are thrilled the discussion has gone mainstream, but she's baffled by the idea of limiting reparations to people who can show a lineage when ancestry is not easy to document and slave owners frequently moved people among plantations in the United States, the Caribbean, and, the, and South America. She's absolutely correct. It is hard to track this lineage, and it kind of builds the case of why reparations is not a good idea, not just on a moral level in the sense of, I didn't do anything wrong, so why should I have to pay for it? But also, how do you track this down in a mathematical way and then to determine who and what should get monetary uh, monetary value or uh, some sort of governmental assistance or free college or buying a house for them or starting a business for them? Like this stuff has a lot of mathematical problems within it because it has a lot of variables. And I don't know how you determine those variables that go in those formulas as well. It says, cool, I guess I tend to be more inclusive rather than exclusive, she said. And maybe it's a fear, a limitation, and there's not enough money to go around. California Assemblyman uh, John Sawyer, Joan Sawyer, excuse me, a member of the task force, said there is no question that the descendants of slaves are the priority, but he said the task force also needs to stop going, uh, ongoing harm and prevent future harm from racism. 
It's in the system there. I just mentioned this multiple times. It's in the system. It's in our laws. It's in how we treat one another. It's how we talk to one another, he said, and no amount of money will make that go away. But at the end, at the beginning of the article, and here's the full circle, folks. At the beginning of the article, they talk about the word atonement. It's not going to atone anything. You're going to end up paying these people out in some way, shape or form for some sort of injustice that happened in the past, but it's not going to alleviate. It's not going to remove that system that they already think was built by the white man to hold them down. You're going to give them money and then they're going to complain about being held down still in some way, shape or form. So why pay the reparations in the first place? If you couldn't make the good decision, before you're gonna make bad decisions later now that does not mean that when you give certain people those reparations that they're not going to make good decisions with it i think there are going to be people that do make good decisions with it and maybe there's a conversation to be had there that they can only use it for certain things they can only use it on things that will actually build wealth you open up somebody a business say a restaurant business and there's 20 restaurants in the span of one mile that doesn't mean that they're going to prosper or you give somebody money or you pay off their house doesn't mean that's going to stop them from taking on another loan and, and go into debt and drive themselves into the ground so there's a lot of things that go into this that I don't think that this, this maybe this platform or this um, this task force is really talking about, or maybe this is why they're divided. They just don't know how to come to an actual answer here. And I want to end off with this. How do you formulate the formula to pay out these people? Like, how do you calculate which people receive certain injustices, which people were affect, affected by slavery, which people were affected by Jim Crow, which people were affected by not re, being able to re, receive a loan, whatever it may be. How do you break that formula down per person? What are the variables that go into that person? I mean, the mathematical formula for this is absolutely batshit crazy. And what tends to happen is they create some blanket formula here that doesn't really mean anything. And so people are being overcompensated and maybe there's gonna be some that are under, but generally people will probably be overcompensated in reparations. And again, it still doesn't fix the general problem like this general uh, California assembly men said, it's in the system, it's in the loss. And until those are broken down, like the 1619 Project wants, like Nicole Hannah-Jones wants, like Ibram Max Kennedy wants, like AOC wants, like Ilhan Omar wants, like Bernie Sanders wants, all these people of the progressive left want. They want to destroy our system from the inside out so that they can alleviate these injustices that they can never pinpoint. What institutions are racist? Furthermore, it's just an institution. What laws in that institution are racist? Furthermore, let's go a step deeper. Who are those in the institution, I meaning the actual people, their names, their faces? Who are those that are racist that are implementing these laws, that are enacting these policies that are holding you down? And how are those policies actually holding you down on a year to year, week, week debate, week basis, or day to day basis? Meaning, I know people are like, well, well, it's going too far. No, I want, I want accurate data here. I want to see what's actually what's actually holding you down. Is it just your decision making or is it really the system? Generally, what you will find through conversation is that people want to blame the system for their bad decisions. That's generally from what I've seen from having conversations with people. They just don't want to admit it because, again, it's always easier to blame something else than it is for yourself to blame yourself, I mean. So with that being said, folks, I am tired of talking here. Thank you so much for watching the show. Let me know what you think about this reparations debacle that's happening in the state of California. Are you for reparations? Are you against it? Let me know now in the comments. And please don't forget to like and subscribe. And folks, I will see you later here on The Bald Brad Show.